so my name is Corey Belden. I'm a fourth year PhD candidate in political science. Um, and we are going to be talking about best practices in action um, in this session. And I was asked to moderate the panel, not because I have best practices, but because I need them badly. Um, so uh, I'm very excited about this, uh, this panel, and we have some great speakers um, on it. So uh, we'll follow the same format as the last. Um, we'll have the panelists each come up and give their presentations, and then we'll do Q&A at the end. And yeah, if you guys can stick to 15 to 20 minutes, that'd be great. Um, and I also, I guess I should also say, um, kind of the context of this talk is that uh, it's really important for both grad students and faculty to invest in, in best practices. And I think as a, as a collective of um, social science disciplines and at different levels in our career, we have to really think about what those look like um, across departments and across uh, research tracks. I also think that um, it's important to integrate these habits early um, in, our, in our careers, um, but it's also important to think about how they evolve as documentation standards and norms change, um, and as our data and computational capacity change. So how do we bring everyone along in this process? Um, and I would say even in my four years here, I've already seen a lot change. So it's kind of uh, scary, and it's important to talk about how we do this uh, together and how we build each other up. So the first speaker today um, is uh, Katie Corker. She's an assistant professor uh, of psychology at Kenyon College and she earned her PhD in 2012 from Michigan State University. And this year she's also joining the faculty at Grand Valley State University. She studies personality and motivation, which is actually what spurred her interest in understanding how we align scientists' behavior. Um, with scientific best practices. And she's published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology and is also the ambassador for the Center for Open Science um, in Charlottesville, Virginia. And she's here to talk to us about the Center's tools for improving scientific workflow, including the open science framework. So if we can welcome Katie. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That's really nice. Um, okay, so this section of talks hopefully should be even more practical. So now we've been sort of presented with the challenges of, of what can go wrong in science, and now we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we can all do to improve um, our scientific habits. Um, our scientific behaviors are habitual, and throughout our training we tend to develop certain habits, and these stick with us throughout our careers. Um, and we're realizing that some of these habits have gotten us into trouble. So some of the habits, like not worrying too much about data archival when we didn't have big computers and easy ways to do this, you know, those are just a product of their time, and now we're sort of figuring out new ways to, to new habits to develop. Um, some of our other habits, like uh, presenting exploratory hypotheses as confirmatory, right, have, uh, are also perhaps a, hopefully a product of their time and things that we'll be uh, working out of. So the scientific method involves many steps, and as technology advances, each of these steps has become more complicated. Um, so the open science framework is a one-stop resource for scientists that helps to simplify each part of the scientific workflow. Um, the OSF is free open source uh, collaboration and project management tool. It's also a registry and repository. So it's really a, a broad uh, package of tools that scientists can use to improve their uh, habits and behaviors at every stage of the workflow. I'm just going to give you a taste of the functionality um, across these five major stages of the research process. So in terms of planning, the OSF is set up for collaboration. Um, the OSF is organized around projects, and these projects are completely customizable. So researchers can set up a project for their lab as a whole, for each research project, however you want to set up projects. Um, so the OSF uh, page for a researcher can really serve as sort of a living lab notebook. It's an open documentation system for all everything that we're doing. Um, each contribution to these projects is uh, credited, so you can have your entire team all be contributors to projects, and uh, it's indicated in terms of a um, sort of time-stamped record, who's done what, um, when certain things happen in the research process, and so there's documentation, um, time stamping of everything that's done. Um, I should also say it also has um, 
robust features for making things open or private as you see fit. So again, this is up to the researcher to determine whether you would want to use this as a fully internal documentation system or whether in uh, alignment with some of the more open values that we were just discussing in the last session, you would want to make this completely transparent um, to the world. It also has a uh, robust pre-registration function that I'm going to talk more about in detail sort of at the end. Um, so here's a sample project page just to give you an idea of what it looks like and I'll point out some of the different things. So you can you know, give each project a title, there's different contributors, you can even have non-bibliographic um, contributors, so people who are sort of like administrators who would be adding content to the page but are not necessarily going to be cited contributors. Um, you have this collaborative wiki function, so each um, person on the project can contribute to documenting sort of what's going on with the project or anything that you would want to, to collaboratively write. You have different components, each of which can be separately private or public um, and can have different contributors from the overall project. It's really, um, it's a robust system that can be used in, in any way that a researcher or research team can imagine. Um, so some of this robustness can be a little bit overwhelming, right? When you start out, you get kind of a blank page and you have to decide how you want to organize things. Um, but it's a, the system is set up with scientific best practices in mind. So you get this nice time stamping of when certain things have happened. Um, the, there's documentation. You can even do version control. Um, and so there's a lot of features there. So it really can merge your public-private workflows. I imagine that probably most people right now, their workflow is some combination of Dropbox, Google Drive, their personal computer, sort of files are sort of everywhere, you're emailing collaborators, right? And there's all of these different kinds of tools, technological tools that have developed to help researchers organize um, their data, their files, et cetera. Um, but the OSF can kind of be one resource, one place that you can do all of this stuff. Um, so as I said, you know, each component for a project, here's one where, you know, there's materials, analysis plan, procedure, however you want to organize it. You can make uh, different components, public or private, so maybe here the materials sh uh, shouldn't be public for some reason, maybe they're proprietary, whatever. Um, you can choose for each component, whether it's public or for private. However, there's also incentives for openness built into the system. So if projects are public, if a researcher chooses to make them public, you get um, information about the amount of time that a file's been downloaded. You get information about the location of people requesting your resources. Um, there's also a feature they call forking, which is essentially copying. So you can set up sort of an overall template for your projects and then fork every project from there. Or let's say somebody else has like a really cool structure, a really neat way that they're setting up their organization of their projects. You can just fork from that and uh, borrow the structure. So there's a lot of um, incentive to be open because researchers can see how other teams are sort of organizing their workflow. Um, and as a researcher, you also get some information about um, how your content is being consumed. Um, there's also persistent uh, citable identifiers. So these just get generated for each project in a variety of styles. Um, you can cite the OSF page itself. It gets indexed in Google and other search engines so people can find uh, your work. Um, and so there's, I think, as norms are evolving about different types of contributions that researchers can make, you can get credit for those contributions beyond, say, the traditional journal article. Um, there's also, I should say, you can get a digital object identifier as well in addition to the, um, the OSF link that you can direct people to. Um, if the project is public, you can get the DOI uh, for public registrations, I should say. Um, so as I said before, we have, uh, in terms of the reporting stage of the research process, uh, we have a collaborative wiki on the OSF that can be used to jointly work on projects. There's also connection between the OSF and other services. So, um, for example, Dropbox, Google Drive, GitHub, right, all these different services that researchers are already using can be connected to OSF. And so, for example, um, with Google Drive, I'm going to show you an example in just a moment of how uh, you can link a Google Drive folder to the OSF and then anytime you say update a document to that folder, it automatically gets updated and archived to the OSF as well. Uh, version control, that's a big deal. So you probably have you know, numerous folders on your computer with documents labeled something like final, final one, <laughs> final two, right? 
So all of that can go away um, if you just upload a document to the OSF. When you upload something over and over again with the same name, it just gets tracked in, uh, in the sort of log. Uh, and you can access previous versions of those documents. Um, the file storage is significant. I think I'm going to get to that in a moment. Yeah, so each individual file that you upload to the OSF's internal repository can be up to five gigabytes. And that just went up recently. So now even imaging data, other kinds of large data files can be easily uploaded. Um, but you can also use other repositories like the Dataverse or Google Drive to, to have even larger files if necessary. <clears throat> In terms of discovery, um, there's a robust search function that's built into the OSF, so you can search for projects, researchers, data sets, and this is something that's continuing to evolve, and as more and more researchers are joining, um, it's going to be, I think, in the future, a sort of really important hub of where you can find people's work in progress work, preprints, et cetera. Um, there's also OSF for meetings, so if you're running a scientific meeting, you can set it up um, so that people who uh, just send you a PDF or a PowerPoint or whatever of their poster or their talks, and then it all gets archived in one place, um, sort of permanently, which is kind of nice. Um, so I'm gonna give you just a couple of examples of really concrete ways that I'm using this tool. Um, I, <laughs> these have been sort of evolving things. I would say, you know, I, I don't think this is the way that I'll be doing things forever, but it's a sort of step on the way towards better practices, and it's an example of some concrete behaviors that you can do right now to improve uh, the quality of your workflow. Um, so here's my super simple lab management system that's integrated with Google Docs. What part of this system is designed to solve a number of problems. One is that we have a large team of people who are working on projects jointly and you have a need to communicate across team members in terms of what's going on with a project. Another is that we have, um, with a, a more open science kind of um, orientation, there's additional components to a project besides just the final paper. <laughs> Right, so we have the data, the code, the materials, uh, pre-registration, right? All of these different components need to be sort of organized somehow. So the way that I've set this up, um, I have a table in a Google Doc that lists my projects. And so uh, this is actually, I should say, it's a riff on um, something that Lauren Campbell developed, but I made it kind of prettier and uh, so it's hopefully nice. Um, so, you know, each project gets a title and whoever's contributing to it is here. I should also say, you know, these folks can be added to the given permissions in Google as well so that they can edit the table and everyone on the team can be involved in documenting the progress of a project. All right, I have my older projects here, some ongoing projects here, you know, different stages, and then I have different uh, columns for each different stage of the research process. Well, the point of this is twofold. One, it serves as kind of a checklist. Do we have a record of the code <laughs> somewhere? Do we have um, you know, the materials available? If we pre-registered it, where is that pre-registration information located? Um, so all of that goes into this um, Google Sheet. Um, next step, you, I created an OSF project with linked Google file storage. Okay, so here's my like project status project. <laughs> and I just enabled Google Drive. And then I put that document in the linked folder and it shows up now and it live updates on OSF. So anytime anyone on my team goes in to that spreadsheet, makes a change, it live updates to the OSF. Everything is public as well, so on uh, in the Google Doc, the OSF, for me, openness is, is an important part of the process. And so what this essentially is, is a it's an open file drawer, right? So even if, all of these projects don't ultimately make it to publication for whatever reason, time, or the student moves on, whatever it is. The information about what we've done so far is there. So when you know, someone else, a new collaborator comes along or you know, more time magically presents itself, right, the information's there. A meta-analyst, -ana anybody who wants it can go and get the information. Um, so this is what it looks like actually on the OSF. It's just an embedded sort of table. Um, and, they, they are working really hard, I think, to make the site user-friendly and also look pretty nice. Um, so pre-registration, the previous talks actually made this easy for me. Now I don't have to talk about sort of what pre-registration is or why it's valuable. We've already heard a bit about that. Um, but 
one of the um, things that hasn't been talked about as much is sort of how does this actually work? Like how do you take a project that you want to publicly pre-register and make that commitment to the scientific community? So there's, as I was kind of hinting at before, several options ranging from um, exploratory to confirmatory um, in terms of how you would set this up. But it, assuming you want to do a more confirmatory type of pre-registration, you have a couple of different options. One is that you can have a fully internal system, so it's non-public, people outside of your team don't have any access to the information about pre-registration, and there could be some benefits even just for your team about doing that, and I think Jahan is actually gonna talk about that more, so I'm not gonna say a ton about that, but for folks that aren't ready to be sort of fully open yet, full internal registration is entirely possible and can still have some benefits. The other two options are two um, pretty robust systems for doing more public pre-registration. Um, so one of these is aspredicted.org, which was developed by uh, Yuri Simonson, right? And uh, it is basically, its main benefit is that it's dead simple. <laughs> so it's nine questions. You go to that website, aspredicted.org. They'll ask you a series of questions, and the questions themselves serve as, as the um, prompts for pre-registration. So what's really nice about having sort of this template of questions that's asked is that it really forces you to think through all of the different choices that you're going to have to make. So, you know, what, how are you going to decide what data points to exclude? How are you going to decide when to stop data collection? How are you going to decide what covariates to include, right? These are things that you think about eventually, right? Usually while you're doing the analysis, but pre-registration forces you to think through those things ahead of time. Um, so this system is nice because it's dead simple. Um, what happens is you'll fill out the questionnaire and then uh, they will send you a link to it. You can use that link for peer review. You can send it out to whomever you like. And it can actually stay private forever on, on as predicted. So you control the um, whether the pre-registration ultimately becomes public or private. That's up to you as the researcher um, forever. For the scientific community, this is maybe not such a great thing, right? Registries in general work best when we have a record of all of the different varieties of, of ways that people can pre-register things. We have a record of uh, what things have been pre-registered and then not f ultimately followed up on. Um, so they allow, for a variety of reasons, they allow the, the pre-registrations to stay private forever, um, but that's maybe not in, uh, in best in terms of the scientific community overall. Um, so the OSF also has a really nice, um, robust pre-registration system. As alluded to before, it can basically just be a frozen copy of a project. So it takes whatever project you've already set up on OSF and just sort of locks it in as it is. Files and everything are intact. And when um, people go to view that pre-registration, everything is as it was before. So you can pre-register on OSF using um, uploading a document. It can just be a sort of analysis plan written however you want. They also have some prompts um, built in, so you can choose to use those prompts or not. Um, if you want to do the pre-reg challenge where you can, uh, a thousand researchers will each win $1,000 from uh, pre-registering and publishing their pre-registered studies, um, you have to use a certain form. So there's sort of more restrictions on the, uh, the pre-reg challenge than there's just on pre-registration generally. But OSF, again, is it's got flexibility built into it so that researchers can make choices that they want in terms of how they're setting these things up. But then there's also some templates and things coming out that are helping um, to set that up. So my slides are there, also at OSF. Um, and so you can get a copy if you want. But that is all I had for today.